Good. Well, welcome back, um, everybody who was through the award ceremony, and we've already had a, a number of new people joining. Uh, taking advantage of having everybody uh, uh, around and, and under our attention, we have uh, we've managed to get people to talk to give us three talks. So Graham Pearson and uh, Nicholas White and David Pollard will sequentially give us a, 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 a talk and the request was to talk sort of about the future of their subjects and wh where where things are going. So uh, we'd like to start off with uh, Professor Graham Pearson from University of Alberta in Canada. Uh, Graham is the Murchison medalist of this year and he's going to tell us about how diamonds illuminate deep earth processes. So Graham, over to you. Thank you, uh, Mike. I'll just check. You can see my full screen now, yeah? Yeah, we can see that uh, very clearly. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So today I'd like to talk about some aspects of diamond research that our group at the University of Alberta have been doing and, and uh, point out a few of the highlights and mention a few directions. And, but I would say that the future direction, of course, lies in all the, the young, excellent researchers that are coming up. In particular, it, it's great to see uh, Andy Thompson, the Murchison Fund winner who's made major contributions to the field I'm going to talk about here, that's, and, and he's been recognized today by the Geological Society. So, so much of the content and results I'll talk about, of course, is generated by a much larger group of people than me, and so here's part of our Diamond Exploration and Research Training School at the University of Alberta on one of those days when there's no snow on the ground in Alberta. Um, so back to diamonds. Here is one of the world's uh, most famous large diamonds. It's the Kohinoor. And the Kohinoor, some of you may know, is the centerpiece of Queen Mary's crown, which forms part of the British crown jewels. The name of that diamond, Kohinoor, means mountain of light. And that's in large part due to the amazing way that the diamond lattice bends light uh, inside it. But I'm going to talk to you today about the way that diamonds such as this and the inclusions within diamonds like this actually um, illuminate themselves the deeper processes going on within Earth, in particular Earth's mantle. So geologists are very fond of drawing cross sections and I'm sure this isn't the only one that you'll see today. But the details of these cross sections get much murkier and less confident with depth, despite the solid lines showing fairly good uncertainty that are often drawn on them. And in particular, once we get down beneath about 200 kilometers into the Earth's mantle, the details get very murky and we have to rely on what I'd call remote sensing techniques, geophysics, and experimentation to give us an indication of what's down there. Um, and that was until recently where a group of diamonds known as super deep diamonds changed all that. So most diamonds uh, that are commercially mined come from this area beneath uh, the, the oldest parts of the continents, the cratons, with lithospheric roots descending to around about 200 kilometers within the earth. The group of diamonds that I'm going to talk about, super deep diamonds, are actually real pieces of earth that come from much greater depths even than that. So starting in the deepest thenosphere here, sampling the transition zone and going down at the very least into the uppermost part of Earth's lower mantle. Many of those diamonds look like this, and if you're lucky, some of them look like these ones on the right. And in fact, this, this group of super deep diamonds has long been known to sample the, 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 the deep earth, pioneering work by Ben Hart and Jeff Harris in the mid to late 90s pointed this out, studying inclusions in these diamonds. And then recently, Evan Smith at the GIA um, really made the astounding discovery that many of these really huge diamonds, such as this one here, that are worth often in excess of 30 to 50 million dollars, are actually pieces of the Earth's transition zone or lower mantle, and they're super deep diamonds too. So how do we know this? Well, 
as I've said, in large part, this comes from work done by Ben Hart and Jeff Harris, where they found inclusions such as those pictured on the right. These are garnets which have solved a, um, a clinopyroxene component. And if we look at this map of the phase composition of Earth's mantle, so we've got mineral proportion along the top and depth along the bottom. It's a sort of phase diagram map of of the Earth uh, in vertical cross section, you can see that garnet, as you go deeper in the mantle, transforms to something called majorite garnet, which is essentially the dissolution of clinopyroxene into the garnet structure as pressure increases. And so these samples have clearly once been majorite and have now solved a little bit and must have come from this majorite stability field. That combined with the discovery of magnesium silicate phases, magnesium silicate perovskite type compositions, MJSIO3, in coexisting with ferropericlase led to the realization that samples such as this are really very likely to come from Earth's lowermost mantle in this region beneath 670 kilometers where uh, magnesium silicate perovskite, now called bridgmanite and ferropericlase are stable. And so, that really then provides us with a sort of roadmap of where these diamonds can come from. What you will have noticed is that I haven't said anything about the olivine high pressure polymorph. So this large real estate on the left hand side of the diagram where olivine transforms to wadsleyite and ringwoodite were not found in these early studies or at least the higher pressure equivalents. The interest in those higher pressure equivalents of olivine, uh, wadsleyite and ringwoodite is that in the mid 80s, Joe Smith um, worked out from, from first principles that Wadsleyite was capable of hosting significant water. And by that, I mean weight percent levels of water. That prediction was confirmed in some very difficult early experiments by Anuay and Colstead, where they demonstrated that both Wadsleyite and Ringwoodite are capable of containing in excess of 2% water. And that raised the prospect then Here's another one of these cross sections that this part of the earth that we call the transition zone here, highlighted in blue, may actually contain very large volumes of water actually as, as, as crystal band OH, but the equivalent of, of potentially ocean volumes worth of bat crystal band water. And that was a very exciting prediction. And so of course, geophysicists immediately went off to try and test that prediction but it's a very difficult question to answer with using geophysical methods. And electromagnetic studies in those days were probably the, the, the most apt at, at investigating uh, and trying to answer that question. And of course, we can see that it led to some rather contrary predictions where Zhu et al in, in a paper in Science predicted, yes, indeed, the transition, transition zone is wet. Yoshino contradicted that and said, actually, no, it's bone dry. And then, of course, as is usual with science, then there's the intermediate view where it's both wet and dry. Sounds like a kind of sandpaper for those into that sort of thing. But the point is, and I'm not poking fun at these methods at all, it's a very difficult thing to look at. And this is where the super deep diamonds come in because they give you real samples of that piece of the earth, the only samples that you can hold in the palm of your hand and look at and study. And so one of the many attractions of this subgroup of diamonds is that the diamond bulk modulus is the highest of any mineral, it's 400 GPA, and that helps to preserve these high pressure phases during their transport from great depths in the mantle to earth's surface. In addition, that means that that preservation might in turn preserve some of the hydrous phases and those hydrous phases may preserve their original volatile contents. The mecca for these sorts of super deep diamonds is actually a location called Juina in, in Brazil here on the edge of the Amazon Craton and in fact on, in the, on the edge of the Amazon jungle. And here we are sheltering from a rather hot sun in that area in 2014. Here are some of the diamonds from Juina. And while there are a few nice ones, most of them you would think twice about giving to anybody that you care a great deal about, but they're really, they, they might not be um, uh, worth much, tens of dollars per carat, if that, the um, scientific value of these diamonds is immeasurable. 
And so in 2014, we were lucky enough to discover a ringwoodite inclusion than one of these high pressure olivine polymorphs. In fact, an, a, a ringwoodite that was still in its pristine crystallographic state. So this is the gamma phase, the cubic phase of olivine when you squeeze olivine to high pressure. And here, so here's a photograph of that inclusion. It's a rather grubby diamond. And when you zoom in, you can see hints of this beautiful ocean blue color that characterizes ringwoodite. Here's some ringwoodite made in the lab by my colleague, Steve Jacobson at Northwestern University. Note the pressures, 18 GPA, 1400 degrees C, transition zone type pressures. And you can see the similarity in, in color. And this is within, still within the diamond. Actually, recently, we, uh, our student Sarah Milne at the U of A discovered another ringwoodite, and you can see much more clearly the crystal form and the, and the color here. It's a bit thinner than these experimentally produced crystals, but still this beautiful ocean blue color. For the original ringwoodite, we took it to the synchrotron and uh, mapped it using confocal micro XRF. And actually, it turned out that this was an inclusion pair with a calcium silicate phase here abutting this turquoise region of ringwoodite, but at very small uh, dimensions. And to cut to the chase, really what we wanted to know after finding that it was ringwoodite is, okay, does it have any water? And so actually uh, these two spectra here took several days on the, on the FJR to measure because we were trying to measure this uh, on the inclusion in, in the diamond and, and make absolutely sure that we were measuring a signal from the ringwoodite. And so on the lower panel, these, these, the, these spectra from experimentally produced ringwoodites, a dry ringwoodite with no OH content would produce a flat spectra here with no absorption in the 3160 wave number region. And then here are two spectra from experimentally produced ringwoodite made by Steve Jacobson with about one weight percent water. And you can see this very large absorption band here at 3160. And our ringwoodite, had, these are two spectra taken at 90 degrees to each other, had exactly that absorption. And we calculate using the latest absorption coefficients, a water content of about 1.4 weight percent water as crystal band OH. And so one question is, well, where does that water come from? I mean, so this is water locked up in a crystal in the transition zone. Now, the obvious question to that would be, uh, from subducted slabs. The, the transition zone must be a graveyard for subducted slabs. So here is a beautiful seismic image from a recent paper by Chen et al and Nature Geoscience. And you can see mapped out in se seismic wave speed, S wave anomaly here, the slab descending into the transition zone. Here's the 410 kilometer discontinuity. And the slab ponds in the transition zone and thermally re-equilibrates. And then here's the their cartoon showing how water transported in what are known as dense hydrous magnesium silicates, which we'll come back to later, transports the water down and then the slab sits there and warms up. And so this leads to the conclusion that at least locally, there must be water in the transition zone. The question is how extensive is it? Although the, there's little doubt that the transition zone must be pretty full of recycled slab-like material if you do the calculation of its volume and slab recycling rates and even take a fraction of these slabs that pond rather than go through the transition zone. So that's water recycled into the deep earth. What about other volatiles? And super deep diamonds record a very clear perspective on the recycling of other volatiles too. You can map that using stable isotopes. So here on the bottom is the carbon isotope composition, which we'll use as a fingerprint of uh, crust versus mantle input, and the nitrogen isotope composition. And this is measured on nitrogen impurities in the diamonds. And if these diamonds and the, the carbon and nitrogen in them solely came from within the Earth's mantle without any recycled crustal input, then their compositions would lie in this very narrow, small box here. However, what we see is that when we measure the data or produce the data, then the compositions vary widely and scatter well outside of that. And you need to invoke a number of uh, crustal N members that contribute to making up the compositions of these diamonds from altered oceanic crust, carbonate, 
uh, and meta sediment components all go into making the compositions of these super deep diamonds. You can track that with oxygen isotopes too. Oxygen isotopes fractionate far more substantially under low temperature surface conditions than they do in the high temperatures prevalent in Earth's mantle. And so here is a study recently published by uh, my PhD student, Margot Rashir, and uh, where we, we measure actually the, the data of interest of the black points here. These are the majorites, these high pressure garnets. These are probably minimum pressures that uh, the majorites come from. And you can see the pink band here is, are the compositions that we would expect if those majorites came from Earth's mantle with no recycled input. And that narrow range of compositions is much smaller than the extreme compositions that are measured by these ringwoodites. And in fact, whilst I've put on here the, these green colors and are mantle eclogitic diamonds that are, that are in the lithosphere that are commonly held to be from altered oceanic crust, where the seawater alteration drives this delta 18 you know, enrichment, the super deep diamond majorites have oxygen isotope compositions far more uh, extreme than that. And these sorts of compositions actually really require that there's a carbonate composition that's coming from that oceanite crust. So these are, uh, are coming from melts of carbonate coming directly from altered oceanic crust. So, so that's recycled oxygen, carbon and nitrogen, as well as the hydrogen in the super deep diamonds. Other traces of crustal recycling involve elements such as boron. Boron is a highly fluid mobile element and its concentration in Earth's crust and in seawater uh, is many orders of magnitude or orders of magnitude greater than, than that in Earth's mantle. Evan Smith from the GIA demonstrated that the inclusions in these extremely valuable blue diamonds come from the transition zone to lower mantle depth. So here are a few Raman spectra from the Smith publication. And those spectra show that, so these are calcium silicate phases. This is uh, um, a transition zone, deeper sphenosphere to transition zone calcium silicate phase. Uh, high pressure pyroxenes and Jeff Benite, which is a uh, tetragonal almondine pyrope type garnet mineral. And these are all indicative as well as the, the black inclusions that you can see here, which are ferropericlase and there's some magnesium silicate uh, phases of a derivation in the transition zone to even Earth's lowermost mantle. Uh, it's also worth noting that these blue diamonds are some of the most valuable diamonds on Earth. The one between the tweezers there is probably worth well in excess of $100,000. And so it's not simple to get research specimens. And so the question is, okay, what is the source of boron in these diamonds? In the Smith paper I've just talked about, they made the link between um, boron being uh, enriched in the crust and in seawater versus Earth's mantle and, and speculated that it must be recycled boron. But of course, the elemental composition is not diagnostic. And as an isotope geochemist, we always like to use an isotopic fingerprint to really examine to what extent that uh, boron might be crustal versus say a primitive mantle composition. So here's the boron, it's a lattice substitution impurity amongst the carbon atoms in the diamond lattice. And even a few ppm of it generates this beautiful deep blue color that is evident in diamonds like the famous Hope diamond pictured here. Okay, so that sounds all very straightforward. Let's analyze the boron in blue diamonds. Well, many people have had that idea. The question is, how the heck do you do it? Because diamond is one of the most challenging of all solid materials to analyze. There are no reference material standards for diamond because it, it is such a difficult material to synthesize and, and put impurities within it of known concentrations. And so it requires a little bit of imagination as to how to come up with a method that doesn't rely on such standards. And so Jeff Noel and I at, at the University of Durham, we developed what we call an, a closed cell laser ablation method where we use photons to actually effectively dissolve the diamond. So here's a laser beam impinging on a blue diamond um, turns out that, that diamonds are a lot more, blue diamonds are a lot more thermally conductive than normal diamonds, which are pretty thermally conductive. And so you have to watch, you don't melt your Teflon cell here. The ablation products you collect, 
uh, in this closed cell and you do chemistry on them. And, um, and we published a number of papers that document trace element and isotopic compositions of a variety of diamonds. Here we're focusing on using this method for the blue diamonds. Uh, Margot Regier, our PhD student, then took a suite of over 20 blue diamonds. This is a black and white image. This is actually a nice blue diamond. And even this small blue diamond is worth several tens of thousands of dollars. And Margot's nicely rastered a few laser pits in it and, and, and vaporized a um, reasonable amount of that diamond so that we can collect enough boron to measure its isotopic composition. This suite of diamonds has uh, the usual suite of inclusions that are indicative of a deep asthenosphere to transition zone and uppermost lower mantle origin. We've got the calcium silicate phases here, uh, more complex calcium silicate phases, lionite and titanite. And then uh, some number of the, the diamonds that we analyze have enstatite and um, ferropericlase inclusions that are characteristic of this um, enstatite being reverted bridgmanite, a characteristic of the uppermost lower mantle. Here are the, the first carbon isotope signatures on, on these blue diamonds. And you can see, so the blue are the blue diamonds. The background here is the large range of carbon isotope signatures for um, eclogitic diamonds from the lithosphere, which, which are generally widely thought to reflect a crust limpet ranging from heavy carbonate-like carbonate -like isotopic compositions here to very light isotopic compositions um, to the left of the diagram. And the blue diamonds are essentially no different in terms of their variety in carbon isotopes, ranging from heavy delta 13C fingerprints to these very light values at around minus 17. And that clearly documents within the carbon a crustal signature for the carbon. That then raises a question, okay, so what is the boron uh, com uh, isotopic composition? And the reason for analyzing boron is that, it, that crust versus mantle compositions also, like carbon, give you huge leverage. The reason that we've got a very large scale here is because seawater boron is way up here at plus 40 per mil in the delta 11 boron scale. So that's the fingerprint of seawater boron. Earth's mantle, the composition for boron has been refined considerably and occupies this tight range at around minus six uh, per mil, minus seven per mil here. And you can see the blue um, range of compositions that's occupied by blue diamonds here are very different from more. They overlap the, 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 the classic mantle value, but they range to considerably heavier values that can really only be explained by a crustal input to the boron signature there. And our preference is that rather than altered oceanic crust or metasediments, that actually the boron is being derived from post serpentinite phases, so effectively seawater boron that does not have the pristine signature of seawater at plus 40, because as you heat these, these, these serpentinites up that are the product of seawater alteration of peridotite, and you devolatilize them, then you fractionate the boron isotopes down to compositions that are a little less extreme, but nonetheless give you enough leverage to see their effect in the diamonds. So here we've got the whiff of seawater derived fluids, possibly in, in post serpentinite dense hydrous magnesium silicate phases that have come from essentially seawater and is now in Earth's lower mantle. Okay, so I'll finish up by just asking the question, well, why do, deep, why do fluids in the deep earth even matter? And, and of course, they matter a lot for the origin of ultra deep volatile rich melts, such as kimberlites. Here's a beautiful picture of a, um, a kimberlite from Northern Canada in a paper we published recently in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. But I'm not gonna talk about kimberlites. Instead, um, I'm going to talk about diamonds and earthquakes because the other thing that deep fluids in the, in the earth affect potentially are deep focus earthquakes. This is the, the, these are the results from a paper that came out last month in uh, AGU Advances, where we speculate on a link between the fluids that, that, that diamonds document in the deep earth and deep focus earthquakes. The mechanism for deep focus earthquakes has been an enduring problem, largely because of the debate and actually the thought that you simply can't 
transport fluid down into the deepest parts of the earth. So here's a, a frequency distribution diagram of the number of earthquake events versus depth in the earth uh, amongst um, in, in areas of, of subduction. And you can see we've taken one of these uh, example slabs from the Flores Sea here. Here's the thermal model, the black points are the earthquake hypercenters. And while fluid is generally held to be a critical component in these intermediate depth earthquakes here, um, the, it, it's generally thought that the presence of fluid at greater depths is not possible in these at these depths in, in Earth's mantle, and therefore a different mechanism has been invoked to explain these deep focus earthquakes. But that's where the diamonds come in. The, di the super deep diamonds clearly document growth from fluids at depths between 300 to 700 kilometers in the Earth. Here's a, a, an inset from a table that we published in that paper. It's got a lot of detail in it. But to cut to the chase, in addition to the fact that the diamonds themselves document growth from fluids, the inclusions in those diamonds also document a, lot, a significant amount of fluid around during diamond growth. And that includes hydrous ringwoodite. We've, we've also found phase A, one of these dense hydrous magnesium silicate phases in, uh, in the diamond, brucite, methane, hydrogen, carbonate as melt, and even I7 have been found in super deep diamonds. So there's no doubt that there's a record of fluid at depth associated with subduction zones in, in Earth's deep mantle. Uh, this is the last of the scientific graphs, which is an extremely complicated um, rendition of what we think is going on here, but it, it, it answers the question, can slabs transport and release fluid at depth, at, it, at the depths of a deep focus earthquakes? And the thermal models and seismicity show that there is a correspondent of slabs producing seismicity at depths between 300 and 500 kilometers, and cold slab trajectories carrying fluids in dense hydrous magnesium silicate phases can do that job. Here again is the frequency distribution of deep focus earthquakes. Really the thing to notice here is this peak here at around five to 600 kilometers and then the deep focus earthquakes just stop, the hypercenters stop there. And so taking that, looking at that distribution in the context of a pressure temperature map of subducting slabs in, in, in the earth, what we've done here is these are the slab trajectories, the dot and the dots are the hyper earthquake hypercenters mapped onto the slab trajectories for different slabs. Hot slabs here in the light colors are on trajectories where they devolatilize really rather quickly, especially their water content and, and the water content that's wrapped up in these high water content dense hydrosilicate, uh, magnesium silicate phases, essentially peters out because um, of the lower solubility at high temperatures in those phases. The, the cold slabs, which are the darker colors here, so the, the, I, I should have said this is the top of the oceanic crust and then this is the, the thermal temperatures in the slab, at slab moho depths here. So top of the crust moho, in both cases for cold slab trajectories, then you, the slabs are capable of transporting volatiles in either the top of the oceanic crust and at moho depths well into the stability field down here that's equivalent to the transition zone, retaining those volatiles. And then if you recall this seismic image of thermal relaxation and the slab heating up, release of those volatiles would then these gray arrows would then be a trigger mechanism for producing perhaps nanocrystalline phases that uh, are the trigger for deep focus earthquakes. So here we have from diamonds hints that deep focus earthquake hypercenters may track fluid release and diamond formation in the deep mantle. And you can't help noticing as a geologist, the, 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 for those of you that have looked at any diamonds, these are not beautiful octahedra. These are blocks and slabs of diamond that we think may have grown in the slate, same fluid release events that have produced deep focus earthquakes. So I'll leave you there with that tantalizing thought. Thank you. Super, thank you, Brian. Um, it's now 1731, so we are, we do need to move on. But 
I, I can't let you go without just uh, a preoccupation with cratons. And it's not, you know, it's, it's a sort of, it's, a, it's a, a lateral thing from what you've been talking about. But clearly a lot of what we understand about the roots of cratons has come from diamonds. And, and diamonds have almost mapped the shapes of cratons in, in, in terms of their, their occurrence. But recently that's become a bit more blurred with all the seismic topography that's, that's uh, tomography that's, that's appeared. I just wonder how, what these deep diamonds, uh, uh, do you see any, because I noticed there were deep, there were diamonds forming way off cratons in your cartoons there. So what are, the, what are, what are they telling us about the lithosphere above us? Anything or, or, or nothing? Or just uh, a total detachment? That's, that's a good question. In fact, the challenge, I mean, the frustration in the exploration industry is that these super deep diamonds, that, that, that they form huge diamonds like the Cullinan diamond, all 3,000 carats of it that would probably sell for, well, who knows, but probably in excess of $200 million these days. But those diamonds, are very, they're very difficult to predict where to find those diamonds. Be, but, but the key to that is in the transport mechanism rather than where the diamonds form, I think, because it's only beneath cratons in the broader sense that you get magmas like kimberlites erupting through them where the craton provides this block. So there's no further melting. So the kimberlite stays as a kimberlite, blasts its way through to Earth's surface and erupts those diamonds. Even if you have kimberlites starting off craton elsewhere, by the time that the, there's no thick lithospheric lid, so those, up, those magmas coming up will turn into something else and the diamonds in them will most likely be destroyed by the time they reach a surface. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you. Really 